Hello and welcome to the eOrganic webinar on using summer annuals on your organic dairy farm. My name is Deb Haliba and I work at the University of Vermont Extension as eOrganic's dairy team coordinator. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and upcoming and recorded webinars at eExtension.org slash organic underscore production. Now let me introduce our speakers for today. Heather Darby is an agronomist at the University of Vermont Extension and also leads our eOrganic dairy team. She conducts applied research and outreach programs in the areas of organic grain and forage, oil seeds, and hops production, as well as cover cropping, reduced tillage, and also provides programs on soil health and nutrient management planning. Heather also farms with her husband and new baby as the sixth generation of her family farm in northern Vermont. Rick Kersbergen is an extension professor at the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. And Rick has been conducting research and extension programs related to sustainable dairy and forage systems for more than 25 years. He is currently involved with several multi-state applied research projects on cover crops, organic grains production, and forage and nutrient management. Thanks for joining us, Rick and Heather. And now I'm going to turn the mic over to Rick. Great, Deb. Thank you. So we're going to do a quick introduction on um, part of a research project that Heather and I are both involved with. Um, and it is a uh, NIFA-funded project. It's a four-year project. and. The Muted. University of New Hampshire was the one that received this grant, but it includes a number of states, including Vermont, New Hampshire, uh, Maine, Pennsylvania, and New York. And it looks at how we can uh, improve the quality of organic milk and also improve uh, the sustainability of organic milk production in the Northeast. And we're doing a variety of different uh, researches associated with this project and it's a really it's a multidisciplinary project and I'm not going to spend much time on this so I'm going to go through it really quickly um, but again it's a real interesting project a four-year project and so some of the things that we're looking at in terms of the objectives um, include uh, it's, I'm sorry I did I did the same thing that I'm not supposed to do which was double click but we're looking at a variety of objectives but I'll just quickly go through the the players on this uh, the team that's been put together by Andre Brito, who is the PI in the project. So we have agroecologists, including uh, Rich Smith and Kirk Groders from University of New Hampshire, and Dave Townsend, who's a reproductive physiologist. And so as you already see, we've got a really diverse team of people. And, and Rich and Kirk are looking at ryegrass and perennial ryegrass, how its adaptability for the Northeast and use in terms of improving pasture systems and its potential impact on fatty acid production. Uh, from cows grazing perennial ryegrass. If we look at some other team members from Vermont, we've got Heather and Sid Bosworth and Bob Parsons. Uh, Sid's doing some ryegrass work, and you're going to hear about some of the uh, summer annuals that Heather's been working on, and Bob Parsons, who's our economist on the project from University of Vermont. And uh, down in Pennsylvania, we've got Kathy Soder, who's doing work with a variety of components of the project, including some of the pasture management as well as some of the flaxseed supplementation that we're looking at for improving fatty acid composition during the non-grazing season. And she's working with Andre on trials um, both with, in her lab with the continuous culture fermentation as well as on farm at the University of New Hampshire Research Facility. And Howard Skinner and Sarah Gosley are both uh, ecologists and they are participating in the ryegrass component of the project as well. And uh, the two lone wolves, in a sense, of myself in Maine and Faye Benson in New York, uh, we're both looking at on-farm research. Both of us have a number of farms. We've enrolled in the project and doing pasture sampling and milk sampling. And then I'm also doing ryegrass trials up at the University of Maine. So, um, you know, we've got probably 14 participating farms in this project. We've got four research facilities. So we're really covering a lot of territory, a lot of diversity in terms of the farms we're working with from small farms that are uh, processing all their own milk to fairly large organic dairy farms and looking at pasture systems and how they integrate their pasture systems and how the winter feeding in pasture systems are also going to uh, work together and how we can improve the quality of that milk coming from these farms, uh, trying to produce in a sense of value-added milk component as we move into the future. 
So if we look at this, we're looking at uh, early season small grains and using those potentially for grazing. Today we're going to talk about summer annuals, which is right here in the center, and then also some late season or season extension work. And we're tying that into pasture ecology and management with the uh, ryegrass trials that we're doing throughout the Northeast. So Andre has already done some work at the University of New Hampshire on flaxseed supplementation and Kathy's done some work with continuous culture fermentations on flaxseed and how that might help improve fatty acid composition during the winter non-grazing season. Uh, we're looking at how that might impact methane emissions and Dave Townsend is looking at how that might impact animal health and reproduction. And really the goal is, is to improve profitability and milk quality on these organic dairy farms. And, uh, you know, the, the milk quality is taking organic milk to a, a little bit higher level. So that's a quick introduction to the project, and I think I'm going to turn it over to Heather now. So, Heather? Great. Thanks, Rick. Let's see. Oop. There we go. Okay, well, uh, yeah, I did what I wasn't supposed to do now. <laughs> there we go. Got it. <laughs> um, well, thanks everyone for attending today, and I'm going to um, keep going with the webinar and, and really get us started on talking about production of summer annuals for both pasture and stored feed um, on, on your organic dairy. Let's see here. All right. So why would you even consider summer annuals? And we're actually getting, we're actually getting into summer now. Hard for some of us to believe where it's actually been such a cool spring, but Summer is on its way, um, and so it's really time to start thinking about whether or not you would plant a summer annual on your farm. There's lots of reasons to grow summer annuals, and some of the reasons um, are starting actually to make a little more sense than they used to. First of all, summer annuals are very drought tolerant, and over the last few years, at least in the Northeast, and I know in other parts of the country too, we've had some very long stretches of, of um, dry weather um, and also very droughty conditions and summer annuals can actually tolerate those conditions better than our perennial cool season forages. Um, summer annuals also can be grown to fill the summer slump uh, time during grazing so mostly July and August where we generally do receive less rainfall and have hotter weather and again the perennial uh, cool season grasses of our area don't produce as much. So these forages can fill in that time frame. Summer annuals are also a really high biomass crop and they can produce lots of forage to be used as stored feed and um, oftentimes summer annuals are used as emergency forages on farms that are running short on forage or in a season where farms aren't able to, to get corn planted on time often they're able to get summer annuals planted to produce uh, more stored feed. The other great thing about summer annuals is that they can have multiple purposes on your farm. They can be used for grazing, they can be made into um, stored feed, I have a misspelled word there already, um, and then they can also be used uh, for grain or harvested for seed. Um, and they also fit really well into different crop rotations on your farm. So there's lots of reasons to consider growing summer annuals um, on your organic dairy. Now again, this is what I was talking about. This is some of the data we've collected from, from the research trial that Rick was talking about just a second ago. Um, and this just illustrates a summer slump. We all know that this happens, especially in the Northeast and the Midwest, where we start to see really um, low production of cool season perennial forages in the summer months. And you can see we have um, strong production in June, September, and October of our perennial pastures, but quite a decline in product productivity in July and August. And so we're really looking to um, have summer annuals fill in this low productivity period. Um, not only is it low productivity, but usually the forages are much lower quality at this point as well. All right, so what is a summer annual? What are the crops we're talking about? And there's a little list here. There's, there's others as well, but these are some of the, the more popular ones. There's sorghum, Sudan grass. There's sorghum by Sudan grass crosses. Um, there's per millet and Japanese millets, and I would say those are probably two of the most popular millets. There's some others as well. There's kind of a, a relatively new summer annual to this area called TEF that people are, are experimenting with. And then there's also um, sort of our standard corn, which um, is generally used for stored feed, but um, people are also experimenting with grazing corn as well. 
So let's talk about each of these um, in a little more depth. We have sorghum. Um, and sorghum, there's grain and forage sorghum. And if you're growing sorghum for forage, um, it's usually in a one-cut system. So there's not very much regrowth potential. So it's not really a great crop, especially to use um, as pasture. So it, it's kind of a one-cut forage system if you're going to use sorghum. It does have um, much thicker stems, and it's not as leafy. So again, it, it's really mostly for forage and also for grain. Um, there's Sudan grass, which actually has um, finer, fine stems and it's quite a bit leafier, so it's a little bit better, it's much better for pasture, and also fits well into a multi-cut stored feed program because it has really good regrowth potential. So it's good both for pasture and also for um, stored feed. And then you have um, the sorghum by Sudan grass crosses, and again we sort of have some of the best traits of sorghum and some of the best traits of Sudan grass merged together. Um, it, it also is much leafier, a little bit thicker stems this, than Sudan grass. Um, the regrowth poten potential isn't quite as good as Sudan grass, but um, it still does regrow and can be used in grazing and stored feed programs as well. One of the um, newer, I guess, uh, characteristics of some of these summer annuals of Sudan grass and sorghum Sudan grasses in particular is that there are BMR varieties that are available, and these uh, varieties are not GMO varieties. Um, they were developed through traditional breeding, and um, it creates a forage that has much higher digestibility. So BMR essentially gives the, the trait of lower lignin to these forages. All right, so the millet itself is, um, it's a much lower growing, the sedan grasses, sorghums, et cetera, are, are pretty tall. They can be five, eight feet tall and even, and even taller, especially when they go to maturity. But the millets are much lower growing. Um, they're sort of a bushier grass, that much smaller stems, a lot more leaf biomass um, than, than the sorghums and sedan grasses. Has, Decent regrowth potential is pretty good, so it is good for grazing and also for stored feed production with multiple cuttings. The nice thing about millet is it also doesn't have um, prusic acid issues, which Rick will talk about a little bit later. Um, and millet itself is, um, it is drought tolerant, but it also can withstand some wetter soil conditions if those do occur, and it often um, times does occur in the northeast. So millet is a little more adaptable to wetter soils than, than your sudan grasses and sorghums. A new summer annual that folks have been um, experimenting with is called teff. It's a, a grass out of um, Africa. It has very fine stems and it's very leafy. Um, it's, it's pretty tolerant to many soil types. It's very, very drought tolerant. Um, and it does have rapid growth like many of the summer annuals. But um, at least in most of the research that I've done so far, it does seem to be really best suited for hay production. It can be used um, for pastures as well, but you need to make sure it's really well established so that the cows don't pull the plants out of the ground. So there's still a lot of work being done on TEF um, to see where it best fits into the, into the cropping systems. Um, all of these grasses that I've just talked about are very susceptible to frost. So they do really require to, that they're grown during the, the sort of heat of the, um, of the summer. Now corn, I think most of us know about corn. Um, it is being used now in grazing systems. Um, it's mostly put up for silage, at least on dairy farms or harvested for grain. Um, when it's used in a grazing system, it is just a one harvest or one graze type of situation. And I can talk a little bit about some of the experiments we've done with that. In terms of establishment, again, they, these are called summer annuals for a reason. They need to be grown in the summer. Um, they like 80 degree temperatures. They loved last summer in the Northeast where it was really hot and dry. They did very well. Um, in terms of planting, you really need to be planting these crops when the soil is at 60 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which for us is really in, in June. Um, but again, most people plant these these summer annuals between early June and early July. So there is quite you know, a span of time that these can be planted um, and still be able to get a good amount of feed from the summer annual. Now, planting these into sort of mid-June and early July also helps with reduced weed pressure 
because you're able to let a first flush and sometimes even two flushes of weeds um, come through and, and sort of eliminate those with tillage before you establish the summer annuals. If you plant too late, we have had folks that have planted um, the, the summer annuals towards the end of July um, and oftentimes there's just not enough soil moisture there to get them started. Um, and then also in terms of production, by the time things really start to get rolling for those crops, the weather's starting to go the other direction and it gets much cooler. So the best yield potential and quality potential for these summer annuals occurs um, when they're planted in early June through early July. Okay, um, in terms of planting depth, one inch is pretty standard for, uh, for most of these crops. Teff is really small seed, so you, you don't want to plant that too deep. Maybe about a half inch would be, would be fine. It has been dry here or was dry here in um, Vermont, so we might you know, go a little bit deeper for most of these crops, so about an inch and a half. But really an inch is, is pretty much the standard um, planting depth for these summer annuals. Um, seeding rates, you, you find the recommendations are really all over the board. Um, and I would say um, I've seen ranges anywhere from 20 pounds up to 60 pounds for the sorghum, the sedan grasses, and the sorghum by sedan grass. So safely, you know, somewhere in the 40 to 50 pound um, seeding rate per acre is, is a good seeding rate for forages, especially for the multi-cut systems. Um, with millet, you're looking at 28 to 30 pounds per acre. It's a little bit smaller seed. Um, and so the seeding rate is a little bit lower. And teff, as I mentioned, is a really small seed, and you're looking at four to five pounds per acre. Um, and again, the best way to really seed these, especially for forages or grazing um, in these multi-cut systems, is with a grain drill. Um, in terms of using these as pasture plants, what many of our growers have, have found, especially with um, with the sedan grass and the sorghum by sedan grass crosses is that successional seedings or successional plantings of these crops seem to really work well with grazing systems because they do grow really fast. Um, oftentimes the cows can't keep up with the growth of the pasture during the summer and so seeding um, at a couple of different seeding dates will help um, keep the forage at a proper grazing um, height. In terms of fertility, the summer annuals really do require quite high nitrogen rates, especially the sorghums, the sedan grasses, and, and the sorghum sedan grasses crosses. The nitrogen rates are really pretty similar to corn. You're looking at about um, anywhere from 100 to 140 pounds of nitrogen required for that crop for the season. So um, applications of manure after each cutting and even sometimes after grazings are really necessary to keep this crop growing and productive. And so we do uh, recommend um, using manure applications prior to planting or if you're turning over um, a green sod or something like that, uh, that will help as well. But you really do need quite a lot of nitrogen for these crops. Um, and the, usually the manure applications are enough to supply the nitrogen or the phosphorus and potassium that you need. In terms of pH, uh, the millets themselves can withstand a lower pH range than the sedan grasses and the sorghum sedan grasses. So millets can withstand pH is really between 5.5 um, and, and 6.5, that range. But your sorghum, sorghum sedan grass, and sedan grasses, really you need to be above a pH of 6, uh, 6 to 6.5 for them to uh, produce optimally. All right. Um, I chose to talk about grazing Sudan grass as that seems to be the summer annual that is, is really best suited for grazing and regrowth. Um, and many of our farmers have actually switched from sorghum Sudan grasses over to Sudan grass because of the, the finer stem and the, the greater leafiness. It does seem to um, tiller a little bit more as well. And so many farmers find that Sudan grass is really a little bit better of a crop for grazing. You do really want to um, wait to graze these plants when they're about 18 to 30 inches tall. Um, and that's, you can see right away how they can get away from you in terms of that proper grazing height. And then when you're grazing them, um, you want to graze them down to six to eight inches. You don't want to take them right down to the ground because they do need quite a bit of regrowth 
to get started again so that um, so they can regrow and you'll have another grazing um, in a few weeks. Now in terms of when the crop is ready to graze, it depends on the year of course, but many of our farms find that um, about 30 days after planting the crop is ready for grazing. So again, it does establish relatively quickly um, and you can get you can get grazing uh, pretty fast after planting. Most of our farms um, are getting about two grazings and oftentimes three grazings per crop that's planted. Um, three grazings is often pushing it and I'll, I'll show you why in a second. Um, but again, you can get two to three grazings per planting. Many of our farms are clipping the pastures uh, because oftentimes there are, you know, stem stem that's left, um, a lot of uneven grazing, and so they they clip it a little more evenly down to about six eight six to eight inches um, to get better regrowth. So I I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the on farm research we we've been doing, and I did mention a little bit of it already, but we are working with many farms around the state to um, do some applied research on farms to see how this actually fits into the cropping systems and then we also do small plot research as well. And this is just a comparison of what we saw last summer comparing our perennial pastures, perennial cool season pasture to BMR Sudan grass pasture in August and you can see that the BMR Sudan grass had much higher quality than our perennial pasture um, during a really dry August here in Vermont um, and you can see right away the, the protein levels are higher in the sedan grass, the digestible fibers is much higher, um, the, the NEL and the um, TDN as well. So for our farmers that are using summer annuals for grazing, they're seeing quite a benefit not only in just having more pasture out there for the animals to graze, but the quality of the pasture is much higher um, as well. So I had mentioned um, three grazings and you can see, and this has a lot to do with managing fertility with this crop, but you can see pr production goes down um, in terms of how much forage is available. It's still relatively high, but the thing that you can see right away is that the protein levels really decline by that third grazing. Um, the first, the first um, grazing, it took about two weeks for the crop to recover, and by the third one it was almost a month. Um, and then the protein levels were very low on the third grazing and there wasn't any additional nutrients being added to this, just the manure from the cows that were grazing and again this crop is a, a, a high nitrogen feeder and so just the quality of that third grazing wasn't there and, and they actually didn't um, really utilize it too well by that third, third graze. And here's just a photograph um, and you can see, if you look down here in the corner, you can see how the cows are grazing it. They do a pretty good job, but there's still some stems left there. When the sedan grass gets really tall, you know, kind of like it is in this picture, you can see it's almost up to their necks. Really, they just go through and start stripping off the leaves, and then the stems are just left out there, um, and that's when it really needs to be mowed. But this is also the benefit of, of successional seeding, so that it doesn't get so far by the cows that um, they're not utilizing it well. Um, grazing millet, it also is possible to get multiple grazings off from millet um, as well. It, the regrowth is pretty decent. Um, I would say sedan grass is a little bit better, but regrowth on millet is there and you can get a few grazings from it. You do graze this at a little bit lower of a height. You're looking at about 12 inches. And again, just grazing to 6 inches, no, don't graze too low because it just cannot recover to really low grazing. Um, and I think that's where we've seen a lot of problems on farms that they just graze it too low and then it just it can't recover very well. There's some cows grazing millet right there. Um, one of our farms also, I thought some folks might be interested in this, um, is grazing the millet just once and then they, they let the millet regrow and head out and then they actually harvest the millet for seed um, and save the seed uh, to be planted the next year. And this is Japanese millet at the Beidler farm in Randolph, Vermont. So they're sort of, um, they're doing a, a double crop system with that crop at their place. Grazing corn. So this is, um, I've seen it in a lot of magazines that have come out. Um, 
this idea of planting corn at about 80,000 kernels per acre, which we did with a grain drill, um, and then and then grazing it. And um, you can see you can see what happened. <laughs> um, it is very very high biomass production, um, but it did it did get by us really quickly. It grew very fast. It was not as drought tolerant as the Sudan grass. We had them planted actually side by side. And um, and once it got up um, too tall, as you can see, it is now. It was um, almost over the cows' heads. They just, you know, they just didn't utilize it very well. They um, would strip some of the leaves off, but most of it got trampled um, and wasted. It was a good cover crop and and um, sort of plowed under uh, crop, but it just was really difficult for the cows to utilize. It was difficult for the farmer to build fence. Um, it was difficult for the cows to eat. And then we thought about maybe taking it for forage, and it just was really too wet to harvest as a forage. Um, and so it just um, it just didn't seem to really work out for us. They did graze it well when it was, you know, just a couple feet tall, three feet tall, but it doesn't stay that way for long, and the cows just couldn't get through it fast enough. And again, with um, a crop like corn, you're only grazing it once, and it doesn't grow back. So in terms of, you know, money being spent on seed and tillage, et cetera, you know, it also may not be the best return for a summer annual. All right, in terms of forage harvest, um, so we're moving from, from grazing these crops and harvesting them for forage. Again, sorghum is generally a, a one harvest crop. Um, it doesn't have very strong regrowth potential. And for a lot of producers, and, and actually we don't do this very much in the Northeast, I think it's probably done more in the South, so I don't really have much experience with this at all, is, um, is one harvest when the sorghum is in the soft dough stage. You know, you're looking at eight foot tall plants at this point. It's a direct um, harvest system where you're going out and chopping and putting it into a bunk um, or a silo or an ag bag all at the same time, very similar to harvesting corn for silage, um, and the quality would probably be somewhat similar to, to corn silage harvested at this stage. But again, this isn't very popular where we are. What's more popular are these multi-cut multi systems with sedan grass and the sorghum by sedan grass crosses. And um, in this situation, the, the sedan grass and the sorghum sedan grasses are being harvested when the crop reaches three to four feet in height. So every time the crop reaches three to four feet, they're being mowed with a, a mowing machine, usually something that has a, a conditioner on it, um, or um, in a wide swath system so that they can dry. And, um, and they're being cut to height about six inches. Again, you don't want to cut them too low. And, and then left to dry and put up as baleage, but more often as haylage um, made into, into silage. Now, one of the, the difficulties with um, these Sudan grasses and the sorghum Sudan grasses is that they have a really, really high moisture content. And um, especially some of the crosses, they have these really thick stems, really juicy and very difficult to dry. So um, using a conditioner will help that a little bit. And then, of course, wide swath um, haylage management works, works um, a little bit better to get these crops to dry down. But they do have a really high moisture content you're looking at. 18% dry matter, sometimes even less uh, with these crops because of the, the stem on them. The, the millet and the teff are both harvested around the same stage, um, sort of the pre-boot boot stage or approximately when the crop's about three feet tall. Um, again, they're much leafier and, and bushier with these really thin stems. So this is a crop that you can actually make into hay. And I know teff has been popular in the um, hay market for horses, um, but it's also becoming more popular in the dairy industry as well. Um, and usually you're harvesting these crops for hay or, or silage, you know, 40 to 50 days after planting, you know, similar to a new seeding. Um, and again, cut, the cutting height is sort of that six inches range so that they can regrow. These are have a moisture content that's a little bit lower and, and easier to manage than the sedan grasses. Again, there's more leaf matter there. Um, but still many of our farmers put, put especially the millet up as, um, as baleage or silage. 
So I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of the yield and quality data we found from our trials. This is one of our summer annual forage um, variety trials that we've conducted in Vermont, um, looking at many different varieties and species. And um, this is just looking at the sorghum sedan grasses and the sedan grasses, just to give you an idea of yields. And um, this is just five different varieties that we trialed from, from a couple of different companies. And you can see the first cut yield, point to it here, is, is where we get most of our yield. And we're looking at about, you know, depending on, on the variety, um, you know, 7,000 pounds of dry matter uh, was our highest. This was in 2000. 10, I believe, yeah, 2010, and then on second cut, we're getting um, a few tons of, of dry matter. So um, a total of about five tons per season for most of the summer, or most of the sorghums and the sedan grasses. Oops. Okay, and if you, you look at the quality, um, you can see the quality, the yield differed amongst the varieties a bit, but the quality wasn't too too different amongst um, the diff different varieties we were looking at, but this just gives you a sense um, of what the quality is for these um, sorghum sedan grasses and sedan grasses, and these are all BMR varieties. We also looked at um, growing the summer annuals with these forage brassicas hoping to improve the protein levels and, and maybe also um, some of the digestibility levels of the feed. We also had this, um, I don't want to say it was a pipe dream, but I guess what I was envisioning was that um, we would harvest the summer annuals, they would sort of excel in the summer months, and then once fall rolled around, they would slow down and the, the brassicas would sort of fill in and then we'd have these brassicas to graze um, in the fall. Didn't quite work like that. Um, you know, a, a lot of the times the, the summer annuals outcompeted the brassicas, and so um, we didn't really have much left in the fall at all for the animals to graze. But here you can just see um, differences in yields. So we, we did get better yields, or higher yields, I would say, when we just were growing a straight stand of um, sorghum sedan grass or sedan grass versus when we were mixing with them with turnips. Um, you know, the turnips just don't yield as much. They're more succulent and less dry matter there and less biomass than the sorghum sedan grasses. So we did have slightly lower yields mixing them together. In terms of quality, though, we did see an increase in quality of the, um, the summer annuals when they were mixed with these turnips. Um, you know, we saw a reduction in fiber, as you would expect. Um, and an increase in protein, which is what we expected as well. I'm not sure if that increase is enough um, to, to warrant the cost of the seed um, and the reduction in yield. So in some ways, I was, I was more thinking after we finished the experiment that it would just be better to go in and, and seed the, the brassicas um, in August and have pure stands of those for fall grazing. Okay, now this is just showing you some comparisons between sorghum sedan grasses and millets. This was Japanese millet. And you can see, um, and this has pr been pretty well documented in the literature, that the millets do generally yield a bit less than the sedan grasses and the sorghum sedan grasses. Um, and in this case, it was, you know, almost a ton of dry matter per acre less um, than our sorghum and sedan grass. And again, you can see when they were mixed with millets, in both cases, yields declined, or mixed with the turnips, sorry. Um, one thing that I think is really, really important to mention, and again, this has been documented in the past, is that millets do actually have um, quite a bit, they have better quality than the sorghum sedan grasses and the sedan grasses. They may, may yield a little bit lower, but they're protein, so these are um, handled in the, in the same way. They have the same fertility. They're grown in the same field. And you can see we're looking at 20% crude protein with just the millet alone and 17 or 18% with, um, or 17 with the sorghum sedan grasses. So the millets, generally with the same inputs, 
will have much higher uh, crude protein than the sorghum sedan grasses. So again, the yield's a little bit lower, but the protein is usually higher. The other really interesting thing about the millets is that um, they are not BMR varieties, and they still generally have much better fiber digestibility than the sorghum sedan grasses and the sedan grasses. So the Japanese millets tend to have higher quality but slightly lower yields. This is um, just a little bit more data from, this is from 2012, and again, I am just wanted to show you a comparison between Sudan grass yields, um, millet yields here in the blue, sorghum yields in the green, and then our crosses in the orange. And you can see that the Sudan grasses um, yielded the highest, so these are just straight Sudan grasses, they are BMR varieties, yielded higher than the sorghum and the sorghum Sudan grass crosses and the millet but the millet was um, sort of our second runner-up in terms of yield, um, producing you know, close to four tons of dry matter per acre um, as well. So good high-yielding biomass crops for sure. Um, and then just looking at <clears throat> pounds of crude protein per acre and pounds of digestible nutrients per acre, again, um, you know, our our um, protein wasn't really all that different, it wasn't statistically different anyway, but the digestible nutrients, again, were, were highest in the sedan grass and then in, this, in the millet as well. So again, the millet, lower yielding, usually better quality, sedan grasses and, um, and the other crosses, a little bit higher yielding, but um, slightly lower quality. Um, and just to finish up my piece, I wanted to talk just briefly about how these summer annuals, you know, they're, they're, um, they fit really well into, the, into crop rotations and double crop systems on organic dairies, and we have many farmers utilizing these systems now. Um, thinking about double crop systems, uh, it's <clears throat> becoming very popular to plant winter grains, winter wheat, winter triticale um, in the fall in August, um, and grazing those the next spring and then planting the summer annuals in the summer, in June, and grazing those, and, um, and then seeding down the next season. So, you know, there's lots of opportunity here um, to, to blend different annual crops, cool season annuals with summer annuals, and perennial forages into a crop rotation um, that improves productivity on our organic dairies. And here's just um, a trial looking at grazing um, triticale in the spring before sorghum sedan grass was planted in the summer. And again, you can see the quality of the feed from um, the spring triticale. So again, you know, a common rotation that some of our dairy farms are using is um, taking a first or second cutting of hay um, off a perennial uh, hay field and then uh, plowing up that field and planting in the summer annual, and this particular farm uses Sudan grass, and you can see they're planting that at the end of June, 1st of July. They're grazing that three times, um, and, and what they're doing at that point is, is uh, one of two things. They e either leave the residue through the winter, makes a nice cover crop, um, and then the next spring they're reseeding the field, or they're planting winter grains such as triticale, that fall and grazing that the next spring. So, you know, again, these summer annuals combined with cool season annuals and the perennial uh, forage crops, you know, really can um, produce some, some high quality feed on our dairy farms and high biomass as well. So I'm going to end there and I just want to point you to um, our website in case you want to find any of these project reports that, that go into a lot more detail um, about these crops and the, the websites there. And I thank you very much, and I'm going to turn it over to Rick. Rick, you, you need to un unmute. There you go. Okay, okay. thanks, thanks. Thanks, Heather, and, and thanks, thanks for that, that information, information because it leads into some of the material that I'm going to talk about. about. Um, um, so there's some support. Uh, Unmuted. You know, Heather and um, Rick, there could you um, unplug and plug in your headset? Because um, it's sounding um, very staticky. I'm 
sorry. It's okay. It's okay. While Rick is doing that, I'm just going to uh, type in Heather's website that she mentioned um, in the chat pod so, so folks can access that. So here it comes. Hey, here we go. How's that? Is that any better? Yes. Much better. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. So um, as, as Heather does lots of work with lots of different farmers, and she showed that, and, uh, and Roger's great in terms of working up at the Alberg Farm Research Farm. So can we switch to the next presentation? There we go. So I'm going to continue on and talk a little bit about some of the nutritional aspects and feeding components related to some of these annuals. And some of this will be a little bit of a repeat of what Heather talked, but I think we're just going to reinforce some points. So um, one of the things I wanted to mention was this resource that was put out a few years ago, probably six or seven years ago, and Ed Rayburn led the way. But this is a great resource, and I know there's a lot of NRCS and Extension people watching today. Um, but if you don't have these resources, they're great resources for learning more and, and sharing information concerning pasture utilization. Um, and it's, a, it's an NRA's series on forage utilization um, and, and forage production as well as marketing for pasture-based livestock production. And it, it was put out by NRA's out of New York, which has now renamed themselves PALS. So if your information Muted. Desperate and want to look for these things, just go to the PALS website at, at Cornell and you'll be able to download these or buy these resources. They're, they're very good. So as Heather mentioned, we're, we're looking at these summer annuals as a way to uh, minimize the yield and quality reductions we see during that warm summer period where we have droughty conditions. And we're also trying to increase the diversity of plant material that our animals are going to consuming. And it also gives us some insurance in terms of, of issues that might be related to climate change, whether we're seeing hotter, drier summers, or just giving ourselves a diversity of crops so we can handle that potential change in, in climate conditions and uncertainty that we see during the summer. And, and realize that, as Heather mentioned, a lot of these crops have the ability to be used in a variety of ways, whether it's going to be used for grazing or for harvested forage or conserved forages. So there's a lot of flexibility in how you manage these crops. And it, by having that diversity, it gives you the ability to make some decisions during the growing season concerning what you want to do, whether it's going to be grazing or conserved forages. So I just want to talk a little bit about forage quality because, as Heather mentioned, a few parameters that made a difference. Um, but realize that you know these forages these cows are consuming during the grazing season are the cheapest source of nutrients. And our cows are healthier. They perform better when they consume a high proportion of forages compared to concentrate. But the real important point is down here at the bottom, this high dry matter intake from pasture forages. It's the cheapest source of digestible nutrients. But the key is high dry matter intake and being able to provide a consistent and adequate amount of pasture resources during the grazing season for these cows to maximize that dry matter intake is really what makes many of our farms in the Northeast profitable during the summer season. So, you know, forage quality can be defined in a variety of ways, including, you know, how palatable it is and the intake potential how digestible it is, and, and Heather showed some information looking at the digestible fiber components of the feeds, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But some of these annuals also have some issues related to anti-quality factors and, and potentially could impact animal performance and animal health. And there's also some issues related to uh, harvest and storage of some of these. So one of the things we heard Heather talk about in terms of harvesting some of those sorghums and sorghum sedan grasses is the high moisture content and uh, potentially having to leave some crop out in the field for a number of days before you can get it dry enough to put it up as baleage um, poses some risks. Um, some of that would be poor fermentation, whether you get a clostridial fermentation from the wet feed or um, so that potentially could be some issues as well. One of the things that's really important is make sure that everyone understands that NDF, which is a measure of the amount of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin in a forage, changes as a plant matures, and this is some data from Larry Chase from New York that just looks at the amount of NDF from a cool season grass, and as you would predict, as it gets goes from a, a vegetative state to a more reproductive stage, the plant becomes more fibrous. Um, but what, what's important is to realize that the digestible fiber doesn't increase, um, it actually decreases. So 
we see a large increase in the indigestible NDF. And so when we look at evaluating forages, we need to look at what's digestible in that forage from fiber components. And the more digestible it is, the higher intake potential it has. And that really makes a big difference in that animal's performance because that is a limiting factor. So that NDF digestibility really drives production, especially if we're look, focusing on high forage rations. And most of our organic dairy farmers are feeding less grain than conventional dairy farmers. They have to maximize that potential in forages. And that higher intake of forage is only possible when you can get it in the cow, get it digested, and out of the cow quickly. And most of the time, you know, room and fill is what limits a cow's ability to eat forages. So if the feeds, the forages are highly digestible, they can eat more and they have a lot more digestible nutrients that they can utilize to make milk. And so when Heather talked about the BMR, that bound midrib gene in some of these forages, it really changes the digestible NDF and, and that really allows a higher intake potential. So those feeds that have high digestible NDF and Heather showed that with the BMR, but also, you know, we saw that with the millet showing the really had a high digestible NDF level and then if you looked at the data that she showed for the triticale also had a high digestible NDF meaning the intake potential is so much greater for those feeds and that really what makes them unique and really a, a positive contribution to a farm's grazing as well as stored forage potential. So just a few things about millet and some of the issues related to millet. Um, you can start to find some millets that now do contain the BMR gene. There aren't many out there, but they are starting. Heather talked a little bit about the grazing management. And, and one of the reasons we want to graze it at a certain height, as well as leaving some residual, is the fact that these millets are a little bit higher in crude protein, but they also have a high concentration of nitrates in the lower part of the plant. And again, if we're growing these during the summer and we have some droughty conditions, that nitrate is really going to accumulate in the lower parts of that plant. So leaving that six to eight inches is important that we don't give our animals or force them to eat something that's really high in, in nitrates and nitrites. So got to be careful of that. You also have to realize that the millet is higher in crude protein than the sorghum Sudan grasses. And we need to think about that in terms of how we supplement these cows. If we're going to supplement them with an energy source, what kind of carbohydrate are we going to give them? and realize that a lot of that crude protein in the millet is probably soluble crude protein or rapidly digestible crude protein. So we need a carbohydrate that's going to match up in terms of its ability to uh, be able to make what we call microbial protein in the cow's rumen. So it's really important to make sure that we match up the carbohydrate source with the type of crude protein. And then Heather mentioned the staggering of the planting dates, which I think is great. And I think if you're going to grow some of these summer annuals, it's an important thing to do because they grow so quickly that uh, you could have a lot of feed and it, it, you really want to stagger that planting if you're going to grow quite a bit of acreage of them. So we talked about the millets accumulating nitrates under on drought conditions. Um, frosts are also a potential problem where they're going to start to accumulate nitrates, especially in the lower parts of that plant. Um, one of the ways you can minimize how much wastage, and we saw Heather had lots of animals and some really tall grasses, and what happens is a lot of times a lot of that feed gets wasted, up to 20, 30 percent of that feed potentially could get wasted. And so one way to minimize that is to, is to limit grazing, meaning that you're going to give them small strips uh, throughout the either the day or depending on how you manage your pastures, but you're going to strip graze them. You're not going to give them a three acre period. You're going to give them um, maybe 20 feet of a field and, and maybe move that two or three times a day, but you also want to use a back fence so they don't go back and graze those lower stems. Um, so if you're concerned about nitrate toxicity, Colorado State has two great publications, one on, on nitrate um, toxicity in dairy cows. I suggest you look at that. It's, it's a, one of the best fact sheets on nitrate toxicity in cows. They also have one on prussic acid poisoning, which we'll talk about in a minute with sorghum sudan grass. But Colorado State is a wonderful publication concerning those issues. So sorghum sudan grasses, um, you know, sorghums are, are ones that usually, as Heather said, are one-cut systems. They're kind of an alternative to corn. Um, one of the issues with anything related to sorghums is they contain uh, the potential for what we call prussic acid poisoning or hydrogen cyanide poisoning. And this is a, a real severe issue if, if you have an outbreak of this on your farm. Um, 
and it's mostly related to whether you're going to green chop these or put them in pasture. Once these feeds go into storage and they're fermented, that issue is not, uh, not uh, going to play out for you. But green chop or pasture having high concentration of prussic acid in the, in the plants is going to be a problem. And if you're going to harvest sorghums, again, Heather said is mid-dose mid stage, uh, but mostly sorghums are used as a preserved forage, not as a grazing crop. But the sorghum and the sorghum sedan grass hybrids, the BMR gene has really increased their popularity just because of that digestibility increase. You see a 5 to 10 percent increase in the NDF digestibility. Um, not all BMRs are the same. There are some different ones. The BMR6 compared to the, the 12 and the 18 have the highest digestibility. So if you're searching for uh, varieties, the BMR6 types have the highest digestibility. And really, they stay vegetative for a long period of time. And really, it's day length driven for how long they stay vegetative. So the quality is maintained. Um, now, there are some grazing concerns. Again, you, you do want to leave some material there, both for regrowth uh, as well as uh, being be able to uh, allow those plants to grow quickly so you can either graze them again or take a, another harvest off of them. So. The prussic acid concentration, we usually say wait till the corn or the uh, sedan grass or sorghum sedan grass hybrids are 18 inches tall. So you want to start grazing when it's relatively tall, 18 to 24 inches. You want to strip graze, leave that stubble so the animals are going back for a second bite. So you want to move the animals quickly. You're going to have to assume some wastage. So some of those, that data that Heather showed, a lot of that was mechanically harvested. So you may not be getting that same amount of of harvest material if they're grazing because there is some wastage in there. Again, check out your carbohydrate supplementation. You want to maximize rumen protein production. And, and sometimes these are rapidly um, digestible proteins, whether they're soluble or rapidly degradable. So you need some rapid fermentable carbohydrates to go with that. Uh, you know, the one source that I always suggest is something like barley. It's, it's very rapidly fermentable and match up quickly with that highly soluble protein. Their frost and drought issues similar to the millet, uh, but most of the time those are going to be related now to prussic acid poisoning, not nitrate poisoning. And the, the two have some similar um, characteristics on animals, but uh, you know you want to be careful about that and, and make sure that you understand that those issues do exist. The other thing that's important is, you know, as Heather said, these are high nitrogen feeding crops, but they're also luxury consumers of potassium. So. Um, if you put a lot of manure out there, you're going to produce a lot of biomass, but they're also going to produce a lot of potassium in that forage. So you want to make sure that you uh, keep dry cows from consuming those because we have some issues with cow milk fever with cows consuming high potassium forages. Uh, and in Maine, one of the other issues we have is, is deer love these um, BMR sorghum sedan grasses. So if you have a high deer population, it may be an issue for you. So here's just a little bit on the, on the protein and, and why it's so important to understand what kind of protein is going into your cows from the pasture system is that we're trying to maximize right over here this bacterial protein. And that's really what drives um, quality milk production. And the only way we're going to get that is by matching up how the protein breaks down in the cow's rumen, matching up with some fermentable energy, and then the bacteria in the rumen basically produce a high quality protein that's going to be digested by the cow lower in the digestive tract. And so if we have too much protein that's broken down and we don't have fermentable energy, a lot of that's going to end up being excreted in the urine. Cows are going to produce a lot of urine and you're going to see high MUN concentrations or uh, blood urea nitrogen concentrations, either one depending on what you measure. Um, and the other way is true as well. If we don't have enough protein, don't have enough degradable protein, we have too much energy, the cows are actually going to go acidotic and we're going to have uh, other issues. So it's important to understand protein metabolism in the cow when feeding some of these. So an excess protein cost because those cows have to get rid of it, it's going to take energy to get rid of it. It also may be detrimental to reproductive performance. And so if you're feeding these, I always recommend that you keep a good lookout on your MUNs. And if you're um, you know, if you're working with dairy farmers or if you're a dairy farmer, then you can get some of these MUN measurements on a regular basis from your, uh, from your processor. That'd be great. It's a really good diagnostic tool. So again, there's some harvest issues that Heather talked about for some of these sorghum sedan grasses. Uh, the wet fermentation is one that concerns me because we potentially can end up with a clostridial fermentation, which could, one, reduce intake. 
Um, but it also does, does not a good fermentation. It's not a very efficient fermentation and the quality of that feed actually degrades over time. That fermentation doesn't completely preserve that feed. Um, it keeps degrading and it also produces some toxic material as well. So the other advantage though with some of these sorghum sudan grasses is that they can be round baled and Heather talked about that although we, we do have, have had one producer in Maine that has round baled corn um, but it hasn't always gone very well. So, and, and just finishing up real quickly, Heather talked about double cropping and, and it's really a, a great method to think about in terms of trying to maximize your field resources and also utilize one crop to benefit another. And one of the things I see is that when we use some of these warm season annuals, you know, if you're a, working with vegetable farmers or if you have a vegetable farm, you realize that some of these summer annuals that we're growing are also considered cover crops or weed controlling cover crops for vegetable producers. And so they do a number of things for you in terms of both um, allowing you to get in a little bit later in the season and get those flush of weeds like Heather talked about, but it also controls those summer weeds as well and really smothers them out. And so coming back with a winter grain crop and, and this is just some spelt um, which is another good winter grain that potentially could be used as a grazing crop as well as a, a grain crop. Um, so these summer annuals provide multiple benefits beyond just what they do for your cow but also in terms of uh, potentially reducing the weed seed bank in your fields. So with that I think, um, I think we are potentially going to wrap up. So Heather talked a little bit about some other options including the brassicas for late fall grazing. Uh, winter grains, we've talked about a little bit about this in terms of, of grazing them in the fall and again in the spring. And we've done a little bit of work of actually trying to grow some winter grains, sowing them in the spring, grazing them lightly during the summer as well as into the fall, and then grazing them again in the spring. Um, you really need to be very careful in terms of doing that, in terms of how hard you graze them during the summer because they can be damaged quite easily. But it's an interesting concept because they stay vegetative during that first year and then potentially go reproductive in the second season. Um, and finally, spring oats can be a real good rescue crop and also as well for extending the season. And they can be sown in August, provide some much needed pasture resources late into the season uh, as another annual to think about potentially extending the grazing season. So that, I, I think we uh, potentially could open it up some questions, Deb, if you want to do that, if we have some time left. We, uh, we do. Thank you, Rick and, and Heather. This was a lot of um, great information um, that you've presented and I'm sure and we've already have quite a few questions. Heather, do you apply manure if you reseed in the fall or sp for spring grazing? I, do we apply manure in the fall for spring reseeding? Um, yes, many of our many of our farmers are applying manure in the fall for spring reseedings. Yes, and, and some of them are um, growing growing cover crops um, after they apply the manure. I don't know if that answers yeah, the question. Yeah, I think yeah. she was asking about timing, like when do you apply yeah. the manure if you reseed in the fall? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, do you, have you seen any problems with calving um, if cattle are grazed on triticale? I, I haven't heard of any, I haven't heard of any problems and, and I haven't seen seen any problems, but I, I don't know any producers that are grazing dry cows on triticale, so I'm not, but we haven't seen any problems with, you know, bred animals. Mm -hmm. um, and to go along with that, anything either. yeah, yeah. To, to go along with that, um, it, it sounds like she grazed goats in their third trimester and they had really big babies that had to be pulled. Well, then that's really good feed, right? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I, no, we haven't, I haven't heard of any problems, but. Yeah, and I'm just curious. We did have a few questions on uh, small ruminants and how um, uh, small ruminants utilize these forages differently than cows. Do you have any information on that? I, I think they'd utilize it pretty similarly, but you know, you just have to base it on their nutrient needs in terms of, um, you know, how high a demand are they? Are they lactating animals? Are they beef animals? Are they, um, you know, the meat lambs? You know, it really, it looks at what's the nutritional requirements of those animals and trying to match it with, with the quality of the crop. Great, thanks. Um, have either of you trialed perennial grasses that are adapted to warmer and drier conditions such as California oat grass or intermediate wheatgrass? No, I haven't. 
Not in Maine. Okay. Um, would you recommend interseeding the sorghum Sudan grass with cowpeas to improve forage quality? I think that, the, yeah, you, okay, there you go. Yes, it is, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of, one of the issues is that the sorghum sedan grass is such a um, competitor that you really need to think about what kind of populations you're going to put out there and whether the sorghum sedan grass is going to outcompete the peas for light. And, you know, both of them are pretty quick germinators, but one's going to do better in cooler season and one's going to do better in warmer season. Yeah, and I know that, you know, a few folks have tried to use the summer annuals as a, like a nurse crop with a new seeding um, and have failed miserably <laughs> because, because the, the summer annuals are so competitive. So. Okay, great. Um, let's see, I have a question from um, about TEF. Will TEF do well with just broadcast planting, I guess, versus uh, uh, drill? At least from the research that I've done, and I, I have, I've only grown teff a couple of times myself, is that it's really small seed. I think if you can and broadcast it really well and then use a cultipacker, you'd probably be, you'd probably be fine because it, it is pretty shallowy, shallow seeded. And then to go along with that, any suggestions on achieving that low seeding rate of four to five pounds an acre um, for the teff? Well, you'd, if you're using a grain drill, you could. In terms of broadcast seeding, I'm, you know, most um, most of our growers that use um, broadcast seeding use fertilizer tenders with um, some kind of blended fertilizer in them to help as a carrier, um, and and there are organic growers that do that as well, not mm -hmm. with synthetic fertilizer, but with other um, types of fertilizers. I don't mm -hmm. know, Rick, if you have, and that'll help you get down to that. Um, I don't know if you can get that low though. It, 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 it is pounds. difficult to do. Yeah. 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 One uh, one of the participants just typed in to say mix it with oats as a carrier. As oh, a there you go. Yep. Yeah. And um, again, on TEF, um, any uh, sources of seed that you? Well, more and more, um, yeah, more and more companies are carrying it now. There's a new variety I noticed um, that we were trialing this year called Corvallis, and I think. Um, many seed companies are carrying it now. Um, I know locally I was able to get it, which I was a little bit surprised. But um, so I think if, you know if you check with your local seed dealer, I bet I bet it's going to be um, more. It's more available now than it was. So and now they have actual varieties coming out. Like I said, this Corvallis is a new one, and I know ours came through King Seed, but I'm sure you can, which is in Pennsylvania, and I'm sure you can get it other places as well. Great. Um, now we're moving on to sorghum Sudan grass. Um, is there a significant difference between heading and non-heading types or grazing versus haying silage types? In, like in terms of quality or yield or just I guess all of it. I um, In non-heading types I guess we I haven't seen a huge difference. Um, I'm we have a few growers that are, are using some of the non-heading types, um, but I they I guess I I'm not sure. We haven't looked enough enough at it yet to be able to say that they're yielding higher or or have better quality at this point. And, and being such a day length sensitive in terms yeah. of when it goes to maturity, and it, you know our season's so short, and these are frost sensitive crops that I'm not sure it makes all that much difference in our short growing season. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, how about your any experience with camelina um, winter seeded as a forage similar to a brassica? I you know we haven't tried that. I've worked with camelina a little bit, and um, I just it's not very leafy. You know, I just don't see it being a. I don't know why you you would do that versus the forage brassicas. It seems like they've been bred for forage quality um, and production. They seem like they're the better better bet. But winter seeding, was that the? Mm -hmm. To graze the next spring. Yeah. I don't That's know if it'll I overwinter here. <laughs> but it, we, Rick, it doesn't overwinter in Maine. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Um, 
but f but for the brassicas, we we've, we've had a lot of growers that actually are going to do oats with their brassicas in the fall, and and that's why they're getting both a uh, little extra fiber, as well as a lot of the digestive nutrients out of the brassicas. And we've done some experiments mixing the um, spring grains with brassicas, and we have a bunch of reports on our website. And I also gave a webinar last year on it, so people could could probably go back and and watch that. But we we saw again some difference. Um, we did see some difference in fiber, just like Rick said, by mixing the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the questioner just um, you know commented that frost seeded camelina has high omega fatty acid. Yes, it does. Yeah. Um, so let's see. The next question I have here is: All the summer forages talked about today were grasses. Where would legumes fit in the system? Might have already addressed that with the cow peas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we haven't experimented much with um, besides soybean. Actually, there have been some projects mixing forage soybean with um, summer annuals, but again the competitive nature of the summer annuals is not really conducive to you know mixing the crops up um, I don't know Rick if you I don't have any experience in that area but Rick, no we, uh, we've tried doing soybeans with sorghum sedan grass um, and it, this the soybeans really didn't yield much biomass at all in that situation so um, you know and again just like Heather said the, these warm season annuals are so aggressive that that the legumes tend to grow a little bit better under cooler conditions and that they just don't match up. Great. Um, next question is, would molasses be a good energy source for these high protein grazing feeds? Yes, they would. I mean, molasses is a rapidly fermentable carbohydrate source and, um, you know, the real issue is, is how to get that molasses to those cows, whether it's going to be, a, you know, a a dried molasses product that you're going to mix with some some grains or if you're going to provide it as a liquid source when they come back to the barn but that's usually the drawback is trying to figure out what's the best method of getting that molasses into those cows mm -hmm. and just a note that we did talk about molasses in our last webinar um, that we did for um, the organic dairy team so I want to just check out our our uh, webinar recordings for that um, okay, so we have another question about uh, this. This one says, "Our organic farmers have an issue of NP balance in our desert climate. Difficult to achieve balance with grass crops." Okay, so it's another legume question. Any um, suggestions about possible legume crops during the summer? Any additional? Mix well, with the summer annuals. Yeah, go ahead, Rick. Yeah, most of our legume crops do relatively well because they're definitely deeper rooted than the grasses. So if we have droughty conditions, a lot of our cool season grasses shut down and our legumes still grow, although not as quickly as they could. So, you know, I'm I'm not really familiar with real desert conditions or dry conditions, but in the Northeast, uh, a lot of grass crops tend to uh, grass pastures during the summer tend to be a high predominance of of legumes just because the fact that they're deeper rooted. Okay, great. I'm not sure I answered the question, but <laughs> uh -huh. um, is millet the only one with no no prussic acid risk, or is teff the same? Teff is the same, and then you know there's other summer annuals as well that people sort of recommend, not in our area, but seen references to crabgrass, <laughs> and, which is a weed for us, but um, and others. I think it's mostly the sorghums and the sedan grasses. Okay. Um, just trying to see if I've missed any here. Um, would you recommend mixed seedings or single grain seedings? For small grains? Um, I'm assuming it was for the uh, I'm not sure. Maybe that maybe the person who asked that question can type right back in. Um, okay. Um, here's another question. How how might you suggest to adapt the, um, this information to a very small farm or a hobby farm, small scale? Any suggestions or any differences? I don't. I mean, I don't really think there'd be any differences. No, I think the staggered planting I think would be even more important for a small farm just because mm -hmm. of the rapid growth. So staggering the planting dates would help. Okay, I think 
I think, unless folks have any other questions, or maybe I missed one, I don't think I did. But if you do have another question or a question, oh, here we go. Um, the question on camelina fall seeded over wintering brassicas. Perhaps winter canola could be an alternative crop for the same application since it's bred for overwintering in very cold climates. Well, our winter canola had almost zero survivability this past <laughs> winter, so... So so did ours, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, I have... Um, we actually had a few farmers in Vermont where it did actually overwinter, where there was better um, snow coverage, where it, it overwintered pretty well. And their goal was um, they actually seeded it with oats that fall, and, and they grazed it um, prior to going into the fall. And some of it survived, you know. So there's some op there's you know an opportunity there potentially. Okay. Maybe in here's a slightly warmer area. Great, thanks. So here's our last question: um, Is it feasible to oversee overseed? Excuse me, a, f a field pea crop with a winter rye or annual sorghum BMR to get some additional weed competition, increased pea straw value, and a regroup of a grass for later forage biomass. <laughs> what was all of that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, over, oh, so the question is: Is it is it feasible to oversee overseed a field a, pea, a field pea crop with a winter rye or annual sorghum BMR? Well, I mean, a lot of at least um, in, to the north of us, and also here, many of our farmers grow mixed grains, but. I, I don't know anybody that's grown them with sorghum, peas with sorghum, but most, you know, a lot of people grow peas with with oats or barley um, in a mix so that it helps the peas stand up, and that's that's really common. Any final words from you, Rick? No, I think I, I think Heather said it great. I mean, <laughs> and, and, you know, it's also, you know, they mature relatively similar times, so if you're going to combine those grains, it works out fairly well. Well, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, we're we're out of time, but I again, I'd like to thank all of you for your questions. Um, as a reminder, please be sure to complete the survey you will receive by email. Um, we really do appreciate the feedback that we we get, so um, please do send us some. Um, and then I want to invite you to our next eOrganic Dairy webinar on June 27, where Dr. Cindy Daly at the California State University at Chico will describe the pasture soil amendment study she's been conducting on the um, university farm there, which is uh, certified organic. And finally, as I mentioned before, you can find an archive of today's session, recordings of our other webinars, as well as articles, videos, and more at eextension.org slash organic underscore production. Rick and Heather, thank you so much again for joining us, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>